So hello everyone, we're doing it in English because we have uh, several guests with us today. Um, I hope it's not an issue. Uh, okay, let's start. Thank you Adal for the introduction. Um, today we're going to talk, the theme of this meetup is uh, API security. Uh, we'll talk about the theory, try to go a bit in depth, and then uh, Ante, the CISOF Skyscanner that came, to, uh, came here to, uh, to talk to us, uh, will try to show us how it looks like um, in really large scales and the challenges and maybe offer some solutions. Um, so let's start. Um, my name is Erez. I'm Director of Security Research in Checkmarks. Um, doing all sorts of security, but now obviously focusing on application security here in Checkmarks. I'm a strong believer in spreading security awareness. Um, this is why we, one of the reasons we're doing that. Uh, and relevant to this talk is that I'm co-leading the OWASP API security project. I will talk about it a bit later. Um, in general, my, my superpower is that I see a lot of mistakes. Um, Checkmarks customers, like every other person who writes code in the world makes mistakes. Some of them are complex, some of them are uh, really a dough moment, but we see all of them. Uh, and also we see how they change out there. Uh, and we currently see a change from uh, what we call traditional applications, things we saw in the past, uh, towards uh, things that are more modern. Um, what is an API? API stands for? Okay, he was first, but there is no prize, so he said it really in a low voice. Um, so, um, yeah, as you said, application programming interface. What does that really mean for us? We decided to go to the Holy Scriptures, Wikipedia, um, and look at what they say. So, uh, an application programming interface, API, is an interface or communication protocol between a client and a server. This is what it is. Why? Because it's intended to simplify the building of client-side software. Uh, okay, I'm good with it. Um, it really kind of tells us all we need to know about what is API. But what is API security? Um, to think about that, we need to see who actually uses APIs. So who uses APIs? Everybody, right. So I try to put some buzzwords here, but really every modern application uses APIs. Um, we see mobile and IoT and B2B and serverless and cloud and single page applications. If you have more buzzwords, please please email me at the end. I'll make this uh, uh, slide bigger. Sorry? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you, that's enough. Um, basically, we all love APIs. We use APIs and APIs are great. Um, so what is my problem with API security? When I'm saying API security is basically API based apps security. So every app uh, will be an API-based app security, or in other words, API security is the security of modern application, of modern apps. Today, we'll talk about how API-based apps are different than uh, their ancestors' traditional apps. Uh, I hope I will convince you that they deserve their own attention. We'll talk a bit about the OSP API security project and put some focus on the API security top 10, which is part of this project. Um, and at the end, I will try to uh, convince you to come and join us and, and help with this project. So how API-based apps are different. Um, in the old days, not that long ago, a client would be a browser uh, on a laptop, on a PC, but a browser. Um, these days, Clients are becoming uh, uh, varied and stronger, and by varied I mean it can be a, a browser, it can be a watch, a mobile, an IoT, a smart toaster, uh, it can be some sort of uh, a B2B application, it can be uh, a microservice stuck somewhere, it can be anything, anything and everything, um, and it's hard to keep to keep track of that. Um, since it's very varied and the clients are getting stronger by themselves, we see that logic uh, moves from the back end to the front end. Uh, it's a gradual uh, uh, process, but it happens, and it has its own baggage. And this baggage is in the form of some vulnerabilities moving from the back end uh, to the front end, 
as well. So let's see it side by side. So we see up there a traditional application and below a modern application. Let's see what is similar. So the similar part is a user interacting with a client. We just said that modern application can be different kinds of clients and they expect to get uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, output from it. Um, they don't care what happens behind the scenes and if it works well, they don't even know. The other similar part is the server getting data from the database. Um, we can see the differences in traditional applications that are more in the uh, uh, SQL domains and modern applications are more in uh, Elastic, NoSQL, etc. Um, but again, they get the information back to the server. It now starts the, the slightly different part. The different part is that in traditional applications, um, the client will send a GET request to the server. The server will get the data. We'll do some rendering. This is the logic part. And we'll send back a, a fully rendered HTML page for the client um, according to, to the data they got. Um, what we see in modern applications is a bit different. We can see uh, a stream of, of API gets. Um, these gets are going to the server. The server will get all the data and will send back raw data. This raw data will go to the client and the client is in charge of the logic part and the presentation and the rendering and presentation. Um, there are less ab abstraction layers. Uh, we see that the client and server and actually the, the database as well, they speak the same JSON language. Um, basically, the server is used more as a proxy for data, while the rendering component is the client, not the server. Uh, clients consume raw data. And we see that the APIs expose the underlying implementation of the app. Uh, sometimes, while looking at the API calls, um, we can understand the underlying implementation. Uh, the user state is also usually maintained now and monitored by the client, something that was uh, solely uh, in the job of the server in the past. Uh, and we see a lot of parameters flying in and out all the time. More parameters with each request, uh, with object IDs and values and filters and, and everything. Um, not necessarily... Um, everything that is needed, and we'll discuss that uh, in a second. Um, let's talk a bit about the REST API standard. So it's standardized and generic and, and very comfortable and very quick to use. Um, it has predictable entry points, uh, which can be good, but for an attacker, uh, if it's good, then it's bad for us. Um, and also, each entry point can be used for multiple purposes. Any DevOps people here? Oh, I want the DevOps people. Okay, so tell them about that. Um, what about DevOps or DevSecOps? We see the speed of change with APIs. APIs change all the time with Kubernetes and Dockers and, and everything that is cloud. It takes just a few clicks to spin up uh, uh, new APIs. How easy it is? Really too easy. It's so easy that uh, we cannot keep track sometimes. API becomes hard to track and it causes shadow APIs. Um, I mean, APIs that uh, are not documented and we don't even know about them. And also uh, old exposed APIs, that things that uh, are not uh, maintained anymore, but can still access places and functions that you don't want them to. Um, it's not all bad though. We see that traditional vulnerabilities are less common in API-based applications. Here are some examples. For example, all the SQL injections, um, they are less common because there are increasing use of uh, ORMs. We see that the CSRF family uh, is getting less, less common because more and more uh, developers use authorization headers instead of cookies, uh, which is a good switch. Uh, things like path manipulations uh, are less relevant in cloud-based storage. Uh, it's not not existent anymore, but it's very different and, and less severe. Uh, and in general, a, a, a lot of classic IT security issues that we see every day in, in traditional applications um, are kind of disappearing with, with SAS. Um, so we wanted to bridge, bridge the gap. We saw that people are still getting educated uh, 
um, on the knees of, of old or not old of traditional applications. Um, but we see more and more issues that are relevant to API uh, centric applications and we needed to bridge the gap. Um, this is a good time to ask people how many of you are familiar with OWASP? Okay, that's a really big majority and that's good. Um, OWASP has everything to say, uh, everything to, to help people to develop uh, good code. Uh, all crumbled up in a very 80s like uh, website. You should visit it. Um, but everything is there. So we try to look at what OWASP says about API security and we didn't find much. Uh, actually, the, the project that everyone knows, I think, uh, of OWASP is the OWASP Top 10. Uh, the latest version was released in 2017, the 10 most critical web application uh, security risks. Um, there is no, not much about API security, uh, not much about modern applications. So this didn't really help us uh, uh, bridge the gap. So we decided to bridge it ourselves with the OWASP API security project. And by ourselves, I mean myself and Inon Shkedi who is over there. Um, he will uh, present himself because he's the next speaker. So I'm just moving on. Um, under this umbrella of OWASP API security project, we have some projects planned. Uh, one of them is the API security top 10. We decided to start with that. Following will be an API security cheat sheet uh, and crappy, which is a completely ridiculous API uh, and intentionally vulnerable API project. For those of you who know uh, WebGoat and others, um, we believe that the best way to, to learn about vulnerabilities is to see them and fix them. Um, so this is in the plan. Um, regarding roadmap, we are now already released a release candidate for the top 10, going hard to finish the, the official version before the end of the year and start the cheat sheet and crappy, and I'll show you how to, to help us in the end. So, uh, the creation took some internal knowledge and experience, internal data collection. Um, we made a call for data and got nothing from no one, and then we, get, uh, we started a call for comments from the community and got a lot of comments, um, and actually this what helped us to, to understand what we're missing and what should be in the top 10. Uh, and now I want to introduce the OWASP API Security Top 10. And that's it. Feast your eyes. Okay. So now I'm going to move over, uh, to move uh, and go and, and explain each one of them in several words. So let's start with BOLA. Broken Object Level Authorization. Um, don't Google it, BOLA, because uh, it's kind of a new term. Uh, Inon invented. Um, thanks, Inon, for that. Um, what is BOLA? What is broken object level authorization? So, think about the, the scenario of having uh, uh, several assets like documents uh, in your database um, numbered 1000, 1001, 1002. Um, only one of them belongs or should get. Uh, uh, to a specific user. So if this user is, is asking, get my document, which number is 1000, please? And you say, of course, that's fine. That makes sense. If the user asks a someone else's document and you still say, okay, here you go, then you probably have some sort of broken object level author authorization. You, the, the, the user that might be malicious managed to, uh, to be authorized to this specific object. Um, why is it so common in API? So the attack surface is much wider in API than in any other traditional application. APIs receive uh, more IDs because clients maintain the user state. And there's no security solution that solves the problem um, unless you put it into your design. Um, oh, that was an important part. BOLA is also a South American throwing weapon. Uh, why not IDOR? How many people here know IDOR? As, an, as a problem, as an issue? Okay, not many, uh, but still, we got this question a lot. Why not IDOR? IDOR is Insecure Direct Object Reference. Um, 
it's the ability to give a direct uh, uh, link or deep link to a specific object and get access to it. Um, it's not really the same with API, it's a bit different. Um, and also we believe the name IDO is not very accurate because it talks about direct object reference, like the direct is the problem. Um, we don't think that giving direct access is good, but we don't think that um, giving a weird name uh, that cannot be guessed uh, is the issue. Uh, we need to fix it at authorization level. So the name IDO, as I said, it's, it hints that the object reference uh, should be indirect, like salted hash map or, or added random string to every ID. We think you should do that, but this is not the issue. The issue here is authorization. If someone managed to guess your string and you gave them the, the document, the, the issue is with authorization, not with the direct. Uh, and also, um, if I asked each and every one of your developers or yourselves to implement some sort of indirect mechanism, add for every object or every ID, add some sort of salt or hash or something, you would probably th throw me out of the room. Um, so again, the problem is not the object reference, it's the lack of authorization. What might happen? So, um, Verizon, uh, recently, uh, had this breach, um, uh, a, a researcher named uh, Dali B managed to access 2 million of Verizon Pay monthly contracts. Um, you can see the numbers here. Uh, he managed to find to find the the, um, the scope of the numbers that uh, describe the contact number. He could just enumerate them and get all the information from all 2, 2 million Verizon uh, customers. And this is just by calling the specific object um, he wanted. Although he, he should have been authorized only to get his own, obviously. Moving on to A2, broken authentication. Um, why is it so common? So authentication endpoints are exposed to anyone by design. Um, you're supposed to log in them. Uh, software uh, or security engineers have misconceptions. One of them, we really see that all the time. Uh, OAuth isn't uh, authentication, it's authorization. Using it wrong will not help you. API keys, API keys should not be used for users authentication. Uh, you can use them for uh, client identification or other things, but not for that. Um, multiple authentication flows in modern apps. Um, we see that all the time, again, in IoT and mobile and legacy and, and deep links with credentials, etc. Um, we see that all the time. Now, there are two main, uh, main types of broken authentication. We can see sometimes lack of protection. Lack of protection would be uh, in case you have a set of APIs and you know that you need to protect several of them. Um, for example, here we, we know that we want to protect uh, a forgot password and login and, and mobile login because these are my login endpoints. Um, then I would be expected to have this extra protection layer, not only, for example, rate limiting that we will discuss in a second, but extra protection. What kind of extra protection I'm talking about? Um, you can think about account lockout mechanism. You can keep, think about CAPTCHA and credential stuffing protection and whatever. But you need to have something, some sort of protection. Um, sometimes having protection is not enough if it's misimplemented. Um, a common example that uh, I actually saw more recently, I don't know why. Um, how many people here use uh, JWT? Okay. So you know you can set the algorithm for none, and then you have no protection at all. Okay. Some of you nod, some of you don't. Um, th this is misimplementation, just using the wrong algorithm or no algorithm. Um, the service doesn't uh, validate the OAuth provider, or for example, if password stored without salt, etc. All the all the issues of misimplementation of authentication. Let's move forward. Um, A3. A3 is excessive data exposure. We discussed it in the beginning that APIs expose sensitive data of other users, but actually they are designed to do that. Sometimes it's part of the design. 
Why is it so common in API? We saw that in the past uh, in development, if someone had the misfortune of, of developing in PHP, um, this was a thing. Uh, but now it's making a comeback with APIs. Um, the REST standard and API economy actually encourages uh, encourage developers to implement API in the most g g generic way possible. It's easy, it's fast, and it's, uh, I heard lately, it's future-proof. If you give all the data now, uh, maybe in the future you'll need it. So, uh, so no. Um, there is a lot of use of generic functions uh, as to JSON. You have an object, just to, to JSON it and, and send it away. Um, what could be easier? Um, you have it uh, in ORMs and it's, it's the most easy, easiest, it's the easiest thing to do to, to just send it without thinking about who's the consumer, who's going to get it. Um, let's see an example. Um, you have here a, a super safe application. Um, developed by Inon, um, and you can see Bob's profile. I think it's a dating app for, uh, for minions, right? Cool. So uh, uh, Bob's profile contains, when you look at it on the mobile, it contains his name, his role, uh, and maybe some hobbies. Um, and we can look at what happens between the mobile uh, and the API, uh, um, the API, you, you can see the, the, the get request where Bob sends uh, version one, users, profiles, and expects to get his profile, 717 in this case. And it gets everything. Um, it gets a JSON that has, as we expect, a profile picture. We, accept, we expect the user ID because we sent it. Uh, we got the name, a role, hobbies, but also address. Now. If I'm looking at this uh, application, uh, I'm not supposed to see his address, and it's not implemented, it's filtered on the, on the client side. But I can definitely see it in the traffic between uh, um, the server and the, and the client. Um, this actually happened. Um, how many people here use Trifun? Good. How many people know what 3Fun is? Even better. So 3Fun basically is a Tinder for people who think that two is not enough. OK. Um, was that safe for work enough? Um, so this is the application. It's, I think it's Tinder-like of, of finding partners. Um, this issue was found recently by Alex Lomas. Alex looked at the traffic. As we discussed, he expected to see um, the picture, um, maybe the name, maybe some hobbies or whatever. Um, but suddenly he looked, he saw that what he's getting is a JSON with exact location, with sex orientation, with uh, uh, with all the settings, and this was obviously not intended to be shown on, on every user. Uh, a get request. So um, just to make it worse, he actually made a map of of the locations that he found around the White House. Um, that got some attention for sure. A he found someone in the White House actually using that. Um, I don't know. I I don't know what which part that is, but. Um, so it happens. Moving on. Lack of resources and rate limiting. I'm not really going to, to go, I'm not going to go deeper into that um, other than explaining the consequences because I think we, this is something that we instinctively understand. Um, if you don't have a limit, two things can happen. One of them is denial of service. Someone will drain all your power. Um, and the second one is brute force attacks. If I can run uh, as many iterations as I want for any password, I will eventually break it. Moving on to five, um, Buffla. You got your left. Buffla is broken function level authorization. Um, it's kind of the uh, the brother or sister of uh, 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 of Bola in a way. 
but here we are not talking about objects that miss authorization, but functions. It's kind of similar, but still different. Um, if we see an admin, let's go the other way around. When you have an API layer, you will have uh, several different domains or layers of APIs. Uh, you will have uh, the public one, uh, some sort of uh, regular or, or developer or whatever, and you'll have the admin API. So if an admin sends a, a, a delete request um, to, uh, a, a, to this API layer, it's legit. It makes sense, and it should be allowed. But some sort of regular user uh, that might be malicious, if he sends the same thing, should not be allowed to do that. So this function that is being asked to be performed should not happen. Why is it common in APIs? Um, okay, so in on we'll go deeper into that. Moving on to A6. A6 will be mass assignment. Mass assignment um, is kind of the other way around, or again, the brother or sister of, uh, of exposure. If in exposure we talked about taking all your data, all your uh, values, everything you have, and just pushing it out to the world without thinking who the client is, here is just the other way around. It's just getting this information and putting it um, where you're supposed to have only safe, uh, safe objects. Um, so again, modern frameworks, uh, they encourage developers to use mass assignment functions. We see it in Node.js, we see it in Rails. Um, and sometimes part of what these assignments uh, uh, contain, it may be sensitive, sensitive or something that a user would not want or would not suppose to get uh, any access to. Um, let's look at a, at a legit request. A legit request by Bob, you remember him from before, uh, is to have send username Bob and password one to six. Um, a malicious request will also include his role. Obviously, we don't expect a user to set their own role, um, but if we have a problem with of mass assignment and we don't really check what we get, um, nothing stops me from setting uh, the role parameter to admin. And now Bob is an admin. Um, it's kind of easier to exploit in API than in other scenarios because instead of guessing object properties, just find the get method that returns them. Um, here's a nice example. Um, you know, this is something you saw in the wild, or is it something that, or you cannot talk about it? Let's say it's not from the wild. Let's say it's a, a, an example. So let's think about a video service. Um, you can put the video and you see the JSON with the name of the clip. You just put the video over there. Um, if I do a get for a specific user and get the video files, what I get is um, if in case I want to create some sort of conversion of that video, I would check what happens and I see that the JSON contains ID and name, again, of the clip and conversion params. Um, anyone can look at that structure and tells me what it reminds them of or where would it go? CLI, okay, excellent. So um, this is something you would probably put when running a command um, of some sort uh, in your terminal. Um, so let's try that. Let's put that here. So now we have not only the name, but we're putting some conversion parameters. Okay, how about a version of codec? And let's try something not destructive. <laughs> let's try format C. Um, it's not destructive. It, it's not destructive because it works only on uh, on Microsoft machines, and there's nothing important there anyway. Well, and no, nobody uses it. It's legacy. Um, but you understand how we can. We don't really need to guess. We ne we we need to deduce and try to get some pieces of information from from one JSON, play with them on another JSON. Something will crack eventually. Um, moving on. Uh, A7, this is kind of a bucket of bad things, um, all the misfits that we could not place in any other place but are really important. 
Uh, security misconfigurations. Uh, we put here everything from weak encryption and unnecessary exposed uh, methods, and someone who forgot CSRF protection and detail too, too details too many details in an error message, improper course, everything that is somehow connected uh, to misconfiguration. A8 injection. So if you can see the OSP top ten. Um, it has injection, it has XXE, and it has, um, where's the deserialization? Here, and they have deserialization. All of those are actually injection, um, but they are important enough to get their own, uh, their own item in the OSP top 10. So why did we move uh, A1 to A8? A1 moved to A8 because um, the main reason that injection is currently number one is because of SQL injections, and as we discussed earlier, SQL injections are getting less and less common in modern APIs because of ORMs and uh, NoSQLs. Um, NoSQLs injections are still a thing, but they're not very common or severe like before, so we had to drop that down. Um, Getting to the one that I think is probably the most important one, um, that would be probably the first thing I would suggest anyone who has APIs in their system, and the most boring one, all rolled into one. So we're talking about imp uh, improper assets management. This is basically keeping your shit together. It's, it's two different housekeeping issues, but it's basically housekeeping. So... You can have many issues if you have lack of documentation. You know that. Um, you know that you have several uh, uh, APIs. Suddenly, no one knows what that API is. Or you have some old, exposed, risky, undocumented APIs. Uh, something that was uh, back in the days. Now it's not covered by API gateways. And the client can suddenly uh, get get through. Um, why is it such a big issue? Uh, we know that API changes all the time because of CI/CD. We discussed that earlier. Uh, developers are focused on delivering and not documenting. We know that. Developers really hate that. Um, I hated that. We have cloud uh, and deployment autom uh, automation and Kubernetes. Um, it's really way too easy to spin up new APIs and machines. API hosts that have been forgotten are a common thing. And sometimes complete environments that have been forgotten are found. Um, what the heck is QA3 old app uh, done by Bob? Please don't delete dot com. I mean, we see that. It's out there. Uh, and the last one, um, not much to say about it. It's really the same as OS top 10, insufficient logging and monitoring. Um, not very interesting, but still very, very important. Um, Please log and monitor. Moving on. So I would like you to join, if you want, our mailing list, the mailing list of this project. Uh, we are announcing new things there. There are many discussions regarding what should go in, what should go out, uh, etc. Also, a good way to contribute is to go to our GitHub project. Everything is maintained on, uh, on, a, on GitHub. Um, and this project is dynamic. and Hopefully, we're going to close it soon as version one and start uh, working on the next project. Um, this is also the place that we will announce uh, the participation for the new projects you saw earlier. Uh, and also, my group in Checkmarks is hiring. Please contact me. Thank you. Questions? Inon, you want to answer that one? The question is about standardization of... Yeah. 
So I think there are many, many things you can do to standardize API security, specifically about OpenAPI. Uh, it's a great mechanism to filter JSONs, but it's not more than that. Many companies try to sell OpenAPI as something that can solve your security problems. You should remember that OpenAPI is the same concept as a XSD for uh, XMLs. It's basically a way to filter JSONs, not more than that. No, the reason I gave it to him because we had a long discussion about that and he was very passionate about what he just told you. I, I can barely hear you. Maybe in the future. Um, not, not at the moment. It's not covered at the moment. You ask what is a good way to do documentation? Using using Swagger is, is probably a good way, um, but my general answer would be do whatever kind of documentation that works for you and easy for your processes. Do something. Um, as If it gets better, you have better status of, uh, you under, better understanding of what you have there. Um, but understanding your APIs, um, what they do, where they go, um, maybe what they contain, do they have some private issues in them, or is it just random numbers, or I don't know. Having some sort of understanding about each and every API is important. It's really hard. It's really, really hard. So whatever helps you and keeps you on track would be a good solution, in my mind. Maybe there are, I don't know, perfect standards or gold standard, but I would say whatever works for you is probably the best. You, you talk about the solutions of of the of the issues. Okay, so if you go and see, if you go and visit the actual uh, the actual paper that we published, the document of the uh, OASP API security top ten, there are examples. There are uh, uh, examples of how it looks in the code and business uh, business cases. Um, some recommendation of how to avoid and how to fix. Um, you have all that in, in the to document already. I did not have the time to cover everything, but um, you can find it there. And also in the cheat sheet that we'll work on, I'm hoping that this will be some sort of uh, a document that will help developers actually with their day-to-day -day work.